Hello, and welcome to this video about cap-camp bending of the LAC operon and circular permutation gel retardation assays. This video is made for MCDB 427 Molecular Biology at the University of Michigan. So we know that there are many different proteins that can bind to DNA. Shown here are bacterial LAC operon DNA, the cap-camp complex, and RNA polymerase interacting together, all of which will be explained further in this video. Oftentimes, proteins can induce changes in transcriptional activity. You may have learned about techniques that can pinpoint what DNA sequence is bound by a protein, such as footprinting experiments. But once we know where a protein binds to DNA, we need to learn more information about that protein's function. One possible mechanism of action for a DNA binding protein is bending of DNA. So why would we care about that? Let's say, for instance, that you have a gene like the bacterial LAC operon drawn here. Here you can see your gene's LACZ RNA coding region. Note that LACZ is the first in a series of LAC operon genes. Immediately upstream of the coding region in the simplified cartoon is the operator, the site where the LAC repressor would bind in the absence of allolactose, a lactose metabolite. For the purposes of this example, we will assume that there is allolactose to function as an inducer in the environment, which has bound the repressor, rendering it unable to bind the operator. In the next site upstream is the promoter, the sequence where RNA polymerase will begin transcription. Note that the footprint of RNA polymerase extends beyond just the promoter. Now closely upstream of the promoter, there is another cis element that can bind to another protein. When glucose, the cell's preferred energy source, is absent, the cell can produce cyclic AMP, or CAMP, represented in red here. CAMP is a transcriptional coactivator that can activate a protein called catabolite activator protein, or CAP, represented in blue, which activates transcription of the LAC operon to transcribe genes required for lactose metabolism. CAP functions as a dimer. Together, this CAP-CAMP complex can modulate transcription of the LAC operon by bending the DNA and interacting with the RNA polymerase at the promoter. This is one way that a protein can modulate transcriptional activity. Here, the cap-camp complex can interact with RNA polymerase to facilitate transcription. Here is another cartoon that diagrams this interaction in more detail. As you can see, the cap-camp complex specifically interacts with the alpha-C terminal domain of RNA polymerase. Through experimentation using a circular permutation gel retardation assay, Wu and Crothers were able to determine that the CAP-CAMP complex bends DNA. They were even able to determine that the angle of the bend is about 100 degrees. Now let's take a look at the method behind the experiment, the circular permutation gel retardation assay. In part A of this figure, you will see a hypothetical bacterial plasmid. Prior to performing this experiment, the researchers already identified the DNA region bound by CAP through previous experiments. They inserted this region of DNA into a plasmid. This DNA region of interest is represented in red, while the plasmid DNA is represented in blue. This plasmid has four restriction sites, numbered 1 through 4. In separate reaction tubes, an experimenter can incubate their DNA with one of these four restriction enzymes to create the DNA fragments shown here. As you can notice, because these restriction enzymes cut at different locations, the relative position of the protein binding site within the DNA molecule is different in each cleavage product. In this example, the protein that binds the DNA also bends the DNA. Restriction enzyme number one cut exactly opposite the protein binding region, so its protein binding site is located in the center of the resulting DNA fragment. Restriction enzymes two and four cut the DNA in a way that leaves the protein binding site off center. In this location, the protein can still bend the DNA, but the position of the bend is simply altered. Restriction enzyme three cuts the DNA right at the edge of the protein binding site. This leaves the protein binding site on the very end of the resulting fragment. In this position, the protein can still bend the DNA, but the bend is on the very end of the DNA fragment. The shape of the DNA has consequences for electrophoretic mobility. In part B of this figure, you can see the fragments again. In part C, you can see their electrophoretic mobilities. The closer to the center of the fragment the bend is, the more slowly it will migrate through a gel. This occurs because DNA of this shape encounters more resistance as it moves through the gel. Note that in part C, on the y-axis of these figures, electrophoretic mobility increases as you go down the axis, just like it would on a real gel. 
Because the closer to the end of the fragment the bend is, the further it can migrate, we can see that the fragment cut with restriction enzyme number three migrates the furthest in the gel, while the fragment cut with restriction enzyme number one, which resulted in centered DNA binding, migrates the most slowly. In part D of the figure, you can see real data from this experiment. In the real experiment, the researchers mapped the restriction sites very carefully and were thus able to estimate the bending angle to be roughly 100 degrees. Now let's apply this technique to new experimental data. This is a figure from a 2001 paper in Molecular Microbiology which focuses on a protein factor called Integration Host Factor, or IHF, which binds to certain DNA sequences in a strain of chlamydia bacteria. Earlier in the paper, Zong, Douglas, and Travers identified the DNA region where IHF bound using a DNA footprinting experiment. They then cloned this DNA region into a specialized plasmid called P-Bend. Cleavage of P-Bend with different restriction enzymes results in uniformly sized fragments with staggered insert locations, as you can see in part A of this figure. In separate reaction tubes, the researchers can add one restriction enzyme to the recombinant DNA, isolate their probes, which is what they refer to the DNA fragments as in this experiment, add IHF, and then run the DNA fragments on a gel to examine their electrophoretic mobilities. In this experiment, the researchers used radio-labeled DNA and visualized bands on the gel using autoradiography. In the first lanes, you can see that the researchers incubated with the probes alone. As you can see, because the restriction sites are evenly spaced, each restriction enzyme gives a band of uniform size. Let's discuss a doublet that occurs when we cut with RSA1, here and here. This doublet is likely due to a third cut site elsewhere in the plasmid. As we can see, the bottom band does not shift when we add IHF. Therefore, we can ignore it in our analysis of this data. Let's take a look at an example of how this P-bend plasmid works. So let's say, for instance, we cut with ECO-R5. As we can see, when we cut with ECO-R5, the fragment is going to have this insert roughly centered. On the other hand, when we cut with BAM-H1, we'll see that the fragment is very off-center. In fact, it's quite a bit to the left. In this case, both resulting fragments are the same size. The only difference between them is the insert location. And that logic can be applied to all of the different restriction enzymes used in this experiment. In the pair of lanes on the far right, you'll see a couple more controls. The researchers simply cut the P-Bend plasmid with restriction enzymes on the end and incubated with and without IHF. Since these bands run at roughly the same distance, this lets us know that the IHF protein is not binding to the plasmid without the insert, which would lead to a shift in the MCS plus lane. This lets us know that IHF binds specifically to our region of interest. In the other set of lanes, the researchers incubated with IHF. As you can see at the bottom, there are some unshifted bands where the DNA did not bind to IHF. However, you can also see shifted bands of all different mobilities. Since we know that DNA fragments are all the same size thanks to our probes only control lanes, and they are all incubated with the same protein, IHF, we can assume that the differences in electrophoretic mobility are due to DNA bending. Let's take a look at a few bands more closely. When we cut with ECOR5, we can see that the IHF binding region of the DNA is roughly centered. As we know, DNA fragments with centralized bending migrate more slowly than those with more peripheral bending. Thus, we would expect the ECOR5 fragment to migrate the furthest toward the top of the gel. The results are consistent with this assumption. Meanwhile, if we cut with BAMH1, we can see that the IHF binding region of the DNA is almost to the end. With the bend located at the end of the fragment, the resulting shape of the DNA gives the least resistance while migrating through the gel. This should result in the highest electrophoretic mobility, which is consistent with the researchers' results. How do you think the mobilities of the recombinant DNA cut with STU1 and PVU2 would differ? Pause here to predict. So, the DNA cut with PVU2 would have less mobility because its bend is closer to the center. Taken together, we can make some conclusions about this data. First of all, all of the probes migrated to the same position after restriction enzyme cleavage without incubating with IHF.
We know that IHF specifically binds to our region of interest because it did not bind to our MCS control bands. We also know that IHF bends the DNA at its binding site. That's why we see these differences in mobility when we cut in different locations on the P-bend plasmid. We know that IHF binds equally well to each probe because the amount of shifted band that we get in each different condition doesn't really change. So the affinity for the binding site is probably the same. We also know that IHF binding sites are not saturated in this experiment because we see some unshifted bands in each lane. Finally, if we were to plot our data carefully, we could determine the angle of this bend. I hope this video helped you understand a little bit more about circular permutation assays. Thank you for listening.